OK. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, my status of embedded Linux talk. Uh, this is a talk that I uh, have given on occasion. I apologize in advance. Uh, I have a lot of material to cover. It's going to be a little bit like this. Uh, and uh, so I have about a little under 70 slides and about 35 minutes to do it in. So uh, that you can calculate that in your head how fast I'm going to need to go. These are the major areas I'm going to go over. The basic purpose of this talk is not to give you in-depth information about anything. Uh, uh, maybe, not, maybe not even information about anything. Uh, but uh, basically, what I want to do is review the last year's worth of things that have been going on, mainly in the kernel community, but also throughout the embedded industry. Uh, so that you have, and then there's a bunch of links in the presentation that will be uploaded to the Linux Foundation site. There's a version one up there, but it's different from this one because it was a week ago and uh, stuff keeps happening. Um, but basically the idea is if you see something interesting that you want to follow up on, uh, hopefully you'll have some pointers and at least knowledge of this. I found, I've been working at uh, embedded companies for a long time and uh, sad to say in the CE space we're always a couple of revs of the kernel behind and uh, sometimes we don't we're not aware of some of the interesting stuff that's going on. So that hopefully this will help you out. So let's start with kernel versions. Uh, the pace of versions is consistent and very good. The kernel processes are working really well. I'm sure they'll talk about it more. They're having a kernel summit right now as we speak, and uh, they keep improving the process. If you look at the history of uh, the kernel releases, uh, for a while there, uh, last year we were averaging about 70 days. That actually has shortened down to about uh, 63, 65 days. Uh, so I think Jonathan Corbett, I missed Jonathan Corbett's talk earlier in the week. He made a prediction, I think. I think he said Halloween. I am not, I, I'm cynical. <laughs> I'm going to predict that it's going to be on November 8th. So I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I should revise these slides when I get new information, but I'm kind of lazy that way. So, uh, so I'll say this next one will be 68 days, closer to the 70-day version we've been having. But... Uh, but so there's all, all the stuff that's kind of in 3.12 is already in there. One of the things I've done this year with this talk is uh, I've switched it around. So there's a whole bunch of information that I gathered up per kernel version for each of these 3.6 through 3.12. And I'm actually not even going to cover that. <laughs> so that's a big departure. So I've left the reference material. It's, at the, it's in the slides. It's at the end of the presentation. So when the slides are online, you can go look at specific features in Embedded that have happened. And I, uh, I see people are still coming in. So why don't we do one iteration of this? There's not a whole lot of empty seats, but if everybody could slide, if you've got an empty seat uh, between you and the middle aisle, if you could slide towards the middle aisle or slide away from, well, slide away from the edges, whatever an edge constitutes for you. So people can sit down as they come in. Uh, what? Uh, no, you can just, you're it's dead center, so you're fine. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, slide away from Jake Edge. Um, so boot up time. So what's the status of boot up time? Well, pretty much, uh, if you put some elbow grease into it, you can get the kernel brooding in about one second. Uh, but it does still take a lot of work per product. You, there's a lot of tweaking you have to do. There's lots of resources available. There's a, a lot of uh, presentations, a lot of materials on this. So the information is out there, but you kind of do have to work on it yourself to get this done. Um, there are uh, a, good, a good recent presentation that I found was this one that I have a, a link to on SlideShare. Uh, so there's, lo there's lots of techniques, and unfortunately, due to the nature of embedded, a lot of times you have to go in and just manually apply these techniques yourself to your project. So, so the kernel's in pretty good shape, but user space, that's a whole other story. Okay, so there's a lot, been a lot more focus on user space recently in terms of boot up time. Angstrom is using systemd. Is Cone in here? Can I smack him? Uh, <laughs> so systemd, yuck. Okay, I, I know how to do RC scripts. Uh, but I don't know how to do systemd yet. anyway. But that's the type of thing. We're going to see these uh, accelerated boot up time uh, systems coming up in user space. Android is really bad. Um, but there are people working on it, and there are commercially available systems for doing Android booting a little bit faster. Most of them involve things uh, like snapshot booting, taking snapshots of the systems. Uh, Jim Huang of uh, Zerox Lab, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, 
uh, did some really interesting work uh, and showed how to get an Android system booting in about 15 seconds. And he was doing some really uh, cutting edge stuff involving um, checkpoint and restart uh, on the process level. And uh, so if you're interested in speeding up Android booting, definitely recommend that you go look at, at uh, his slides. He's got some great material there. In terms of graphics, uh, we're seeing in general in the industry, uh, not, you know, embedded covers a wide range of territory. And so we're seeing in the industry, you know, there's still lots of devices that have, you know, little LCDs displays, but we're also seeing at the top end, we're seeing a lot higher resolutions. And so um, a lot of interesting work around the GPUs, the buffer management involved with those, uh, movement away from frame buffer. You got this crazy stuff coming out of Google, uh, render script, uh, which is basically compile, compile on the device some of the uh, G GPU specific materials to optimize uh, for the specific device at runtime. Um, but one of the big issues, because we're moving so much data around, is the buffer management. Uh, the, the, we have these big, da uh, big buffers, and so you really have to be paying attention to how many copies of the data you're doing. Um, and, uh, and also, an area of graphics that's always a sore point for Linux is uh, embedded GPUs. Uh, so I don't, know, I, I don't know of anyone that's actually shipping commercial production. Uh, well, I don't, I, I don't know of any. Maybe you guys do uh, shipping with an open source drivers for their GPU. Um, so there are, however, and this is something that's changed pretty recently, and it's pretty neat, that there are lots of SOC GPU open source projects going on. And they seem to really like these anagrams. So the Lima project is for the Mali GPU. The Etna Vive is actually Vivanti spelled backwards. Uh, great is Tegra, Freedrino, that's not an acronym, that's... Uh, um, so, but there's a, so there's a lot of uh, GPU work going on in open source, and that's actually a really good thing. And, uh, you know, I, I thought maybe pigs were flying or something. Uh, <laughs> NVIDIA is even helping out with the Nouveau driver, which is pretty cool. Um, and so uh, there is a shakeup going on. So it's surprising that even this late, or I, I don't know, I, I kind of think of it as late in the evolution of embedded, that uh, we're seeing uh, different chipsets, different GPUs jockeying for position. You see that Mali and Vivanti, just in the last year, have really started to come on strong. Um, and some big shifts in the GPU space. What? Uh, I, I really should have attributed this. <laughs> I got it out of some article online. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, it's confidential. I can't reveal where I got that from. <laughs> Actually, I just made it up, right? So. <laughs> Um, so, uh, in terms of file systems, so um, we, there's, uh, there's still interesting work going on with file systems. Kind of the biggest news, I think, in the last couple of years has been the movement away from raw NAND flash over to EMMC. So you get this block layer between you and the flash. Uh, and that has some interesting uh, effects. Uh, it's kind of well understood in the file system space that uh, Linux file systems were not designed for block devices with kind of zero read latencies. Uh, you know, there's no seek head latency, there's no rotational latency, and so uh, Flash is capable of a lot more I.O. operations per second, and that affects the design of file systems. And so we're still in kind of a process where we're tuning the existing Linux file systems for Flash devices. Um, and uh, so one of the things that we've done in the CE workgroup is we hired a company to go out and look at some of those tuning options, existing uh, configuration options for the Linux kernel and for existing flash file systems to indicate, uh, kind of help developers choose which file system might be more pro most appropriate for them. Uh, the three that we looked at in our study were ext4, uh, butterfs, and f2fs, and, and then measure the effects of different tuning options for those. Um, so there's a result document that's on the eLinux wiki. If you're interested in this, in the performance of your file system on eMMC, highly recommend you go look at it. The, 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 the uh, executive summer, uh, summary of the entire document is, well, the tuning options depend on your workload. <laughs> what a surprise. Uh, so, but you can look and they have all these different workloads they've run and stuff. Um, and I think big news uh, in the file system space is this F2FS. 
uh, which is a flash-friendly file system developed by Samsung. Uh, this was mainlined in Linux version 3.8, so a lot of us who are running on older kernels uh, have not seen this yet or had access to it. Uh, they just added support for security attributes in the latest version of the kernel. Uh, it's log structured. It's way too complicated to go into all the details here. There's a really, really excellent talk uh, by the Samsung developers on this, both at ELCE last year and ELC uh, in the US. Um, and I heard that Moto X is using this. I heard this from another Sony mobile developer and uh, that they're, it's getting really good results. So I used to have, this bullet point used to be, I don't know how good it is, but I've heard that it's pretty good. Uh, but I don't have numbers. Um, anyway, so that's something to look at if you're doing uh, mobile devices. Uh, you really should be looking F at F2FS and, and see, the, see if it works for your workload. Uh, and then uh, I, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention the XFAT incident. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, kind of a cloak and dagger type of story. Uh, so the XFAT file system is a file system that was standardized for SD cards. And um, so it's almost a requirement to support it if you're in the tablet or mobile phone space uh, or cameras or, or any of those devices that take uh, uh, plug-in media. Uh, so there was some code that was released by a Russian developer and it was uh, liberated from Samsung. Uh, <laughs> we don't know exactly how this came about. Uh, we're not sure about the license. It, I think it had been shipped as a binary module by Samsung. Uh, it looks like if you look at the source code, maybe some of the code was derived from the kernel, and so it should have been GPL. Samsung released the code as full GPL a couple weeks later. Uh, if I were you, uh, I'd be really uh, careful about using that code. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. There are, there are ways to uh, interface with the XFAT file system. At, uh, I'll just tell you Sony's solution. I'm not recommending this to anyone, but our solution is to access it from user space so that we're not, and we're doing it with non-GPL code. Because you have to pay royalties if you, if you work with this file system. And so there's, uh, and royalties and patents and GPL don't go along together. So enough said. Uh, actually, more than, too much said, actually. Um, so memory management. Uh, it's confidential anyway. Yeah, it's all confidential, so. <laughs> Uh, in, <laughs> yeah. So the Ion memory allocator is uh, the new Android memory allocator to allow sharing buffers. Well, I've got a slide on it. Allows sharing memory buffers between different subsystems in the kernel. Um, and it, this is again to reduce copies. Uh, different devices uh, have different memory constraints, whether the memory can be cached, whether it needs to be contiguous, um, so whether it's DMAable. Uh, so Ion can detect uh, select the different memory areas to fulfill these constraints so that uh, different subsystems can communicate uh, and, and have the appropriate memory for them. But, so this is a pretty neat system, and there are other things in the system like DMA buff or in CMA in, already in the kernel. This has some kind of neat, unique features, but it also is Android specific. It uses ARM specific page accessors probably have a difficult time getting mainline, but I know there are people already working on looking at it and seeing if the ideas can come into those other subsystems or, um, or ways to make it more generic, to, more suitable for mainline. So power management, and I've got a, uh, I'm already behind, okay. So uh, if you look at the evolution of power management, we started with some easy stuff, suspend, resume, stuff that kind of comes over from desktop and laptop, and then we started working on voltage and frequency scaling, longer sleeps with tick reduction, runtime device power management so we can flip on and off individual uh, IP blocks in the, in the kernel, and uh, the, the big thing, race to sleep, try to get to sleep as fast as possible, which is kind of the usage model for mobile devices. Uh, most people, except for teenagers, are not on their mobile devices active 90% of the time. Uh, but, so most of our times our phones are asleep. Um, but so we've already done a lot of stuff with power management. And so the new stuff tends to look kind of crazy. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about these real quick. So there's auto sleep, power wear scheduling, including big dot little scheduling, memory power, power management, and full tick list. And uh, I apologize for going so fast, but uh, I'm going to go through these really quick. So auto sleep is basically wake locks under a different name. And this tests Raphael theory that you just need to rename it to get it into the kernel. Uh, <laughs> 
And, and the answer is yes. That's what you need to do to get something into the kernel. Uh, Power OS scheduling. So there's this, uh, there's a lot of schedule, and some of this stuff is not mainline yet. Sleep, that auto sleep stuff that I just said is. But Power OS scheduling, there uh, were meetings on Tuesday about this. A lot of this is still out of the kernel, but the basic idea is to select processes, uh, try to migrate them off of CPUs so that you can put more CPUs in an idle state and, and conserve power. Uh, and that's kind of the whole thing about big.little. So in big.little, uh, the idea is you have some very high-powered processors that can do work fast. You have some low-powered processors that uh, can do work very power efficiently, and somehow you balance the workloads between those. Uh, this is kind of what I think big.little is like. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's a crazy scheme, and it's going to be hard to get it to work right. Uh, but if you can do it, it'll be kind of neat. I don't know. So fast, efficient, I don't know, one of those two. Um, so there's been a whole bunch of stuff about big.little scheduling. Um, and how to achieve that. There's stuff with multi-cluster power scheduling. Uh, the big dot little actual scheduling stuff is often called in-kernel switcher. And because, that's because it's switching the workload between the, uh, the more capable processors and the lighter, lower end processors. There was some really interesting work that was reported on at LinuxCon Japan. Uh, by some guys at uh, Renasas. We're still waiting. I don't know if uh, it's someone raised their hand if they know if uh, big.little has actually shipped in anything and we actually have real world results. I don't know of any. Okay, so I'll take that as a no. And then memory power management. What? It has shipped already. Has it shipped? Yeah. What kind of product was it in? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, they were laughing next door. What? <laughs> <laughs> So what, what was it in? Sorry. S4 in uh, Asian market. Okay. Oh, the S4. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Well, smoking Samsung. It's only using the switcher, though. It's not using big little scheduling. Oh, it's not. Okay. So it's in. Okay. So a lot of this stuff is kind of dribbling in. So it's pretty interesting. The other thing in power uh, that I'll get to really quick is uh, device PM uh, and. Uh, I mean, memory power management. And so this is kind of the same thing as with the processor, except instead of moving stuff around between processors, you're moving around between memory regions so that you can actually shut memory banks off. And so, and I don't have time to talk more about that. Uh, full tickless, uh, this is another thing. In order to isolate CPUs, uh, we have no, the no hertz option in the kernel already, but that's for if you are, uh, if you're idle. This allows you to shut some CPUs off completely, even when you're active, by migrating processes off of them or by keeping, keeping them isolated from the rest of the system. Um, and there's information on that. OK, so system size. Uh, some of the things that have been going on is volatile ranges. I don't know if you're aware what that is, but that's the ability for processes to hand memory back to the kernel and say, hang on to this. Uh, I if you need it for someone else, you can destroy it. You can take it away from me. But if you don't need it for someone else, uh, keep it around. And I, if I ask for it later, give it back to me. So this is really good for stuff like browser caches, where you're, you can have the performance associated with having that caching. But if you get low on memory, it's a voluntary relinquishment to the kernel of the, of the memory. Uh, so it's, it's really good. There's also some work that Lexmark did, similar type of thing with having a broker manage uh, voluntary memory regions. Um, a lot of people have been working on different systems for reducing some of the major components, like the libc. Uh, so uh, some work on uh, bionic libc and eglibc, uh, particularly in the area of configurability. Um, I did this big project. Uh, this was at my former company, which was Sony. I'm now working for Sony. Uh, <laughs> it's a long story. And if you've ever worked for a, a mega corporation, you know how that works. But um, Anyway, so this is, I did a bunch of research uh, and looked at some existing research. Uh, the thing I'm most excited about in the near term is uh, this set of patches called the link time optimization patches. Uh, I was able to apply them on ARM and I got an immediate, completely free 380K reduction in the kernel size. And that was not even putting some work into it. I did some other things like system call elimination and com kernel command line argument and elimination. The academic research on the kernel indicates that about 50% of every kernel 
is completely unexecuted code. And so there are these systems for trying to reclaim that, either to compress it or eliminate it through some other kind of really difficult heuristic mechanisms at the linker level. I've got a presentation on that if you want to look at it. In terms of security, I'm going to just blow past this really quickly. Uh, the interesting thing in security, I think, is that we now see mainline Linux security systems uh, being used in embedded products. That was not true just a couple of years ago. So we're seeing SMAC has been adopted by Tizen. It's got a simplified rule set, and in the security space, simplified means 40,000 rules. Uh, but also, Android has adopted SE Linux, and I always thought and, uh, SE Linux was going to be way too big to be adopted in the embedded space. But uh, the NSA, bless their hearts, besides spying on people, they, uh, uh, they rolled up their sleeves and reduced the rule set for uh, SE Android and got it down to a 71K policy size. That is, like, amazing. Um, so we're, we're now can actually use some of these high, what I would consider high-end security features, mandatory access control, that type of thing, in embedded. Um, and that's pretty nice. Uh, there's also a really excellent talk uh, by a guy, uh, David Sav Safford, talking about how to secure low-end devices without adding additional cost to add things like detecting firmware modification, preventing modification, doing signed updates, and all that stuff. And I'll let you look at the, at the slides for that. And then uh, one thing I saw at LinuxCon Japan I was really excited about is a thing called KTAP. For years, we were hoping that in terms of tracing, uh, system tap would be available. But they just never seemed to get the cross-compilation stuff right. Uh, but this KTAP actually has an interpreter in the kernel. And so that is, uh, I think, a pretty exciting new project uh, to look at uh, for kind of future tracing stuff. And what? Uh, <laughs> What presentation would be complete without some kind of discussion about device tree? Um, so, yeah, I don't know, a, a, a tree with yarn on it. I, I have no idea how that relates. But um, let me cut right to the chase. I'm, I apologize to the device tree guys. I know there's some in the audience. I don't like device tree. Um, it's, it, okay, so it supports single Z image, uh, which is really important. Um, and it, do, it does some really good things. It requires drivers to separate, separate hard, not hardware configuration. I've learned that that's the wrong terminology. The hardware definition from the code. Uh, and so it pushes the code away from platform data structures. Uh, but it offends my embedded sensibilities. And I have to explain what I mean by that. So I come from the old school where, man, you compiled a kernel for that hardware, dang it. And, and, uh, and it was optimized for that. So I think in the process of moving to device tree, uh, we're losing the ability to statically configure and highly optimize. So since I spent the last like year working on how to statically optimize the kernel, the stuff in device tree, you lose all of that, uh, at least that I've found. And so I'm actually kind of trying to think of some ways that I can kind of reclaim that uh, it's also kind of a royal pain. Um, so there, but it's a new requirement for implementing ARM board support and drivers. I found it a little bit complicated to use. Uh, there's numerous device tree uh, presentations at this conference. And uh, it is what it is. Uh, we're going to have to, to work with it. And, and all of these complaints that I have listed on this slide are actually being actively worked on. Um, and so this is a bit of an unfair slide. Uh, Let's see, I'm just going to, okay, so in, thing, in terms of things to watch looking forward, uh, we have those Android features, the volatile ranges, and the memory allocator uh, that have to do with, uh, with memory management. Uh, we'll see a lot more device tree churn. We're, get, we're probably going to see a schema uh, analyzer or a schema checker uh, validator, I guess is the right word, for device tree. We're going to see some maturation. Uh, in a lot of the documentation and probably some more uh, changes to some of the infrastructure for that. Uh, and power where scheduling. The other big thing kind of looming on the horizon, it's been looming for years and years, is non-volatile mass memory. And what do I mean by that? I mean persistent uh, RAM is what I'm talking about. And it comes in various forms. There's phase change RAM. Uh, there's MRAM. This stuff has been kind of lurking around the edges for years and years. I actually saw a demo five years ago of a phone that had MRAM on it. So the RAM, when you turned the phone off, the RAM state held its contents. Um, if this stuff ever makes it to a price point that, uh, where it gets into embedded devices, it's going to be really, really interesting. Uh, Linus had some interesting remarks about it last year at, at uh, LinuxCon. 
Uh, he says it's not going to change kernel key algorithms. Those take too long to change. Probably what will happen is if this stuff becomes popular, it, it'll affect the first place it'll show up is in the file systems. And so that's just kind of something to be looking at. It would be really interesting in terms of power management what happens when this persistent RAM, uh, if, if it becomes popular, if it becomes adopted. Okay, so with that, uh, let's talk about the C workgroup projects. So this last year, we just had um, one that I really want to highlight, and that's the EMCC tuning guide. I already talked about that a little bit. We did just, um, and I already had a slide on this. I'm not sure why that's in there twice. Uh, we just had our open project proposals. We had about uh, 18 proposals. And uh, we discussed them this week. We selected eight projects to fund. I can't really announce them yet because we haven't gone through our final approval. But hopefully we'll select some projects uh, this week uh, to finalize and fund. And so one of, one of the projects I think it's safe to say that uh, uh, we approved was actually some funding for some device tree documentation. So we're actually trying to roll up our sleeves and help with some of that stuff. Um, uh, the other, kind of another major project that we're working on is called the Long-Term Support Initiative. It's a kernel uh, that is kind of geared towards having, uh, it's based on the LTS, the Community Long-Term Stable Kernel, uh, but it's got a couple of extra things that the industry thinks would be good to integrate into the tree. So there's some pretty rigid rules about what you can put in a long-term stable kernel in, from the community standpoint, pretty much only bug fixes. Uh, and in the LTSI tree, there's a little bit more flexibility there, and it's really intended to give uh, the embedded industry as a whole uh, a common kernel to work on that's, that's held for a little bit longer in terms of stability. So uh, the, the kind of the news here is 3.4 3 has been available for a while. Uh, we held some workshops in Japan and talked about a testing mission. There was actually a presentation this morning on that. A white paper was released recently talking about the value of that, and it's pretty clear that the next... Well, the LTSI is always based on the current LTS. So the 3.10 was just announced by Greg Crow Hartman as the next long-term stable community release. And so we'll be basing the next version of LTSI on that. Um, so some other stuff. Uh, I have more slides. I'm going fast. Uh, just in terms of uh, tools, a uh, couple of things. There's a core dumper that I saw at ELC that I thought was pretty interesting. Um, I've done this type of thing in the past. Doing crash dumps on embedded platforms is a bit of an art. And there was this new tool that I saw uh, at ELC that talked to, um, about how to do a sparse core dump. You can't really do a full core dump. You don't have the memory for it. Um, and so if, you, if you're looking at crash dumps and the kind of the issues around that, this is a good presentation. Also a good presentation on debugging techniques uh, by Kevin Dankwart. Uh, in terms of testing frameworks, we have a lot of testing frameworks. Uh, the CE workgroup is looking at uh, funding some more work uh, around the LTSI kernel for testing. Uh, there was a good present, uh, actually a birds of a feather session by Matt Porter. Um, and uh, we're always looking for input. If you want to provide input to us, either get on the LTSI dev mailing list or the CE Linux dash dev mailing list. That's where we kind of hold our conversations about these things. Uh, build systems. We have an embarrassment of riches. Uh, I've been working with Embedded Linux for 20 years, okay, and I know some of you are probably shocked because I, I look like I'm only 30, right? No. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, so, um, and it used to be the good old days, well, I, the bad old days, I guess, you used to have to compile GCC by hand on the command line, and it was a royal pain, and now we have all these tools available. It's, it's like the golden age of Embedded Linux. It really is. Uh, we've got the Octo project, which is this uh, very big high-end system. Lots of documentation, lots of support. Uh, we've got build root. Uh, we've, we've got Android, and there's a lot of things people can be doing with Android, even if they're not using uh, kind of the upper, upper parts of the Android stack. So we've got an embarrassment of riches for build systems. In terms of distributions, uh, we've got Tizen out there. Uh, we've got... And that seems to, well, you know, I'm not sure where it's being positioned. It looks like it's maybe heading towards automotive. Um, but I know Samsung still is interested in uh, using that on smartphones as kind of a hedge against their Android bet. Uh, they've got Android use in, uh, you can use Android in non-CE, and Kareem often talks about that. 
And uh, Yocto, if I, if I was to position some of these, so Yocto project, I don't know what they call the distro that's inside it, whether Pokey's kind of still a build system, but Pocky, sorry. Uh, yeah, Pocky. Um, so Pocky is kind of the new in-house distro that you, that you kind of, uh, I was going to say mangle, that's not the right word, that you manipulate yourself, that you change stuff. And then Angstrom is actually a really nice kind of package distro. So there's a package feed, you can get new binaries for it. It's kind of like the um, embedded desktop OS where it's really easy, you can get new binary packages. And it's very common on development boards. The BeagleBone comes with Angstrom, a lot of boards do. Uh, so we've got a variety of, of distributions. In terms of resources, we have the eLinux wiki. There's, it's, a lot of the information on here is stale. That's kind of the nature of wikis. Well, at least this wiki. <laughs> Uh, but uh, there's lots of information out there, and you often see references in other people's uh, presentations to specific pages out here, either about power management or especially boot up time or things like that. There's a project if you want to get involved with, the video transcription project. We're trying to get, we try to have references to the last eight years worth of ELC talks. We've got as many presentations as we could gather up there, including links to a lot of the videos that have done by Free Electrons and, and other folks. And uh, we really, we'd like to try and transcribe some of those to, to make that material very easily available. Um, miscellaneous, so I want to talk about kernel community civility. That was kind of an issue that came up. Uh, embedded contribution status and some hardware. So there were some complaints in, over the last couple months about how, uh, whether or not the kernel developer community was uh, civil enough. Um, there was a lot of discussion. In the end, I think everybody thinks it's a good idea to be as civil as you can. Some people are saying, well, you kind of need to be harsh. You don't want people to get the wrong idea. Um, you don't want to be vague about your rejection. Uh, and sometimes rejection is needed to, to help people do the right thing. But it's being discussed at the kernel summit. I think this is, uh, overall, I think it's the trends we're seeing. The kernel mailing list is a lot more civil than it used to be. Trust me on that one. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think we're in a pretty good shape here, and I think it'll continue to improve. Um, hardware, one of the things I thought, and this is kind of unfair, I just kind of picked uh, a couple of things that were interesting to me personally. Uh, the Intel Quark processor was announced at IDF this year, Intel Developer Forum, and it's a power efficient 486. It really shows that Intel is um, diving low. Um, they have a Galileo board that is not out yet. I think it's supposed to come out uh, early next month that is Arduino compatible. So this is Intel targeting the maker market. Um, it's a signal of Intel getting into the low end. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot more stuff with Linux uh, being targeted at the Internet of Things. Uh, and so, you know, the next couple billion devices should be running Linux. That's kind of our, that's kind of, I would like to see that happen. Also, the Apple has this uh, M7, uh, and this is not related to Linux, but this is a trend in the hardware, is that we're seeing separate processors being used to offload specific uh, functionality, especially in mobile devices. And this is primarily for power management, but it's also to enable things that you wouldn't normally have. So even if your phone is in full standby uh, on future Apple phones, you'll be, cattle, you'll be logging location information, ostensibly for the purpose of serving the user. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, but that's interesting. I mean, there are, there are interesting things that users can do with a, a full location data, right? Uh, and so um, I think it's an interesting trend. Well, I think we'll see more of that type of stuff. Um, in terms of contribution status, uh, embedded companies are doing more and more contributions to the Linux kernel. Uh, in the, if you look at the LWN.net and the top 3.11 contributors, you see a lot of SOC vendors. You see a whole lot of Linaro out there. Um, and uh, so this is really good. If you're just now getting into contributing to the Linux kernel, there's an excellent, um, excellent document I found uh, talking about the me mechanics of contributing your very first patch to Linux. Highly recommend that. I think it would still be good for us to continue to publish best practices for companies. Um, and there is still this problem with what I call version gap, where you know there's a whole lot of companies, uh, my company included, we're shipping 3.4 on most of our cell phones, and uh, it'd be a lot nicer if we could be shipping 3.12. Well, we won't, you know, we won't, 
we'll, we'll never be right at the top of tree when we were releasing products because there's a QA cycle and all that, but we, it should be nice to be closer to the top of tree. Um, and so that's always something. Uh, so maybe device tree will give us the stable API we've always wanted. <laughs> ha ha. Uh, um, okay, and then this, this is what I wanted to kind of leave time for. So I have this new thing, and this is where I, I'm going to turn it into a little bit of a birds of a feather session, which is the best of. So what I want to do is I want to hear from you, uh, at least in these two categories that I've chosen, what do you think is the smallest uh, Linux system that's actual shipping product. So I found one, and then also the fastest booting. So I found a product, and I didn't even try very hard, so this is me being lazy. The TP-Link MR3020 has a Wi-Fi hotspot, hotspot. It ships with a 4 meg flash ship. It's got 128K U-boot, 1 megabyte partition for the kernel, and a 2.8 meg root file system. It ships in 32 meg of DRAM. And I know the 32 meg, that's like, oh, come on, Tim, you didn't even try hard. There's got to be a system out there that's running in 8 meg of RAM or 4 meg of RAM. So does anybody know of anything that's actually smaller than this? Okay, what do you got? Uh, Tell me about it. Tell me what it's called. It's the smaller version of that. Oh, it's the smaller version of that. What, what's... <laughs> See, I, I didn't even do research. Well, okay, what do you got back there? Okay, Momoto, how do you spell it? Uh, Momoto, or Narrative. Okay. Because the Energy Micro EFM32, which runs Linux from the frame buffer, which is only 4 meg. Okay, what was it? Say it again. The EFM32. EFM32. If, uh, just give me whatever's Googleable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to look those up, and I want to continue to kind of improve this and uh, kind of have like a little, not a contest per se, but just, you know, let people know, well, what's the smallest we're doing? How are we doing on the smallest? Okay, so the fastest boot, so these are not shipping products. So supposedly, uh, I, think, I think these may have been kind of the same effort. Uh, you can boot a Beagle board in 630 milliseconds. Uh, that's pretty impressive. I don't, uh, when I did this, I kind of knew whether that was going all the way, I know it's going all the way to user space, but I don't know if it's getting actual video application up and running. Um, Monta Vista, uh, a couple of years ago, touted, touted this dashboard boot in less than a second. Does anyone know if that made it into product? If, if cars have this sub one second boot? Okay, I need, to, I need to keep looking at that. Does anybody know something really fast? I believe it was in Chevy Volt. Was, it was in the Chevy Volt? Yeah. Is the Chevy Volt running Monta Vista? Oh, that's pretty cool. I'm mistaken, I'm not working for Monta Vista, but... Okay, well, I'll, I'll check that out. Okay. A Volvo with an OMAP 4. Oh, how come all these cars? I guess the cars are. Okay. Okay. I'll look at that. Okay. Well, that's cool. Okay. So we have systems out there booting in under a second. I don't know what Android's problem is. Um, <laughs> okay. So. Uh, Resources. So this is where I get my material from, uh, and uh, LWN.net. I just am totally ripping them off. <laughs> so if you are not a subscriber to LWN.net, please subscribe. Uh, I plug them. This is a, there's a great resource, um, and even if you don't need the information, you should throw a couple of bucks their way. Um, the, in terms of the kernel releases, uh, Kernel Newbase always does a really good page in, in addition to the LWN.net pages. Um, and then uh, the slides from this and all previous ELCs and ELC Europe's are available on the eLinux wiki. Uh, so, and there's a ton of information. If you find yourself wanting to find out about some topic, uh, you really should go back to these slides. I don't know how Googleable it is. Um, I don't know if Google picks up a lot of times on the searches, but it's worth kind of scanning through and finding the slides. Uh, the CE work group, a lot of the discussions we have, like about these projects that were proposed, happens on the CE Linux dev mailing list. Uh, and then the LinuxCon Japan slides just a couple of months ago, that's where those slides are located. Um, overall, the status of the industry is very healthy. Uh, a very conservative estimate uh, is that over 1.5 billion, B billion devices have shipped with embedded Linux. And this is a, absolutely a conservative estimate. 
Um, if you look just at the number of Android phones, it's above 900 million. And if you look at all the TVs, all the digital cameras, all the routers, uh, we're well over that, but it's really hard to get the actual numbers on, on those individual categories. So we're still growing strong. So we used to joke. We used to joke about world domination. That used to be the joke we did. We don't joke anymore because it's kind of it's kind of rude once you've done it. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's all I've got. Uh, thanks for listening. We've got time for a couple of questions. OK, are there any questions? I left time for questions, and I'll feel really bad if nobody asks anything because I <laughs> went so fast. Oh, uh, there is up here. We could pass it back. Yeah. Um, so you say the, the processes of the Linux kernel are, are good and healthy, and uh, I agree. Yet, uh, to recap my talk earlier, I think we there is a something to be aware of, and that is uh, it's totally great that a lot of uh, companies are now contributing to the kernel, but the way we get new code and patches uh, does not scale with the amount of review and maintenance we have. And yeah. uh, hearing that uh, the industry is healthy is nice to hear, and I think the next step would be to see that assuring the quality of the Linux kernel by maintainers, and so it's not nothing to do anymore with what a dev develop developer does as a side project next to his work, but to recognize it as an independent job and, and putting some money into it. That would be really good to keep this great quality of Linux we want to have. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And that, that's actually, that's not a new problem, right? So it's, it's uh, always been, it, it's always been hard to get uh, the amount of review you'd like on, on stuff, and it's especially, um, in my opinion, it's especially more difficult because a lot of the SOC vendors are relatively new at con contributing, and uh, my experience as Sony is that the, the product engineers, they're on a treadmill, they're on a deadline, and they're usually not the ones that the company's going to have work on open source. Uh, there was a really great talk by Andrew Morton a couple years ago uh, about how to structure your um, kernel development team so that you've got some spare resources off to the side not, that are not on the treadmill uh, that can contribute uh, to the mainline effort. And I, I agree with you. I think it would be really good for companies to do more of that to make sure that they have dedicated people helping out on, on projects and review and that type of thing. And I think we're going right now, especially with the... Um, with all these contributions we're seeing from SOC vendors, it's a real big crunch, and it's a significant problem. So I, I don't have an answer, but you know, I talked with you. There you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, that study you did on the flash file system is interesting. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Um, so the study you did on the flash file system is interesting, and I was wondering if you'd ever plan doing one uh, which would actually measure the wear leveling of those EMMCs. Um, I'm trying to remember. They did. There was a robustness component. Because I remember that. reading it, and they said, "Well, we're not going to test this. It's too expensive, oh, too lengthy, okay. or something like that." Yeah, I don't. The wear leveling, you have to run them for a long time, right, to to see where they. Because there's no way they're black, total black boxes. Absolutely. You, yeah. you, and so you have to run them till they fail, and see. That's what, the whole point. <laughs> so, um, I don't. Okay. We don't currently have plans to do a follow up on okay. that study. So. Sorry. Right, okay. So I'm over two. Okay. <laughs> any any other questions? Okay. There's one in the back. Um, with regards to test systems and frameworks, etc., uh, I understand that there's a new kernel test framework that Intel um, have invested in um, that runs tests on each kernel commit, etc., and uh, builds it and runs it. Does it build and it provides detailed output uh, on each commit? You know. I, and stuff yes, like that. I, is, I, is it worth? I mean, is that an option for discussion to find out 
optimizations that could be done within the kernel and, and such? Yeah, I don't. I, there is something I, I and it was discussed at the last kernel summit. Does anybody here remember? I don't remember that much about it. There is something that's running, I think, on every kernel commit, or at least on the you know the stable ones that it can yeah, build systems from. It's called zero day, which is okay. a lot of things hard to Google. Um, but uh, yeah, it runs. <laughs> Okay. Do you know if it is it doing uh, ARM in addition to like Intel hardware? Or? No, it's not. It's okay. Okay. Oh, maybe we should get this. I'll repeat. So there's something called Zero Day, um, and it does do builds on multiple trees, uh, multiple configurations. I'm assuming. I think that's what I heard at the last. Yeah, it does multiple different def configs for multiple different architectures. But as far as I know, it's only booting on Intel hardware. Um, but it's ex ex extremely fast. Sometimes you get a report, if you're a maintainer, you get a report that you broke before you even get your pull request out, which is really nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's, that's uh, run by uh, folks at Intel. So what about uh, Lenaro? Is, I know Lenaro has a test effort, and is so anyone qualified to talk I, about the status of that? Or? Being that I work for Lenaro, maybe I shouldn't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's done some work and it's working really well and he's going to do some more. <laughs> <laughs> so f for ARM, uh, Lenaro has a whole test framework that currently has been um, mainly focused more on the Lenaro releases, which hasn't been very useful. Actually, it's not useful at all for, for upstream maintainers and so on. The goal is that this the lava thing you mentioned is going to get to a point more similar to what zero day does with automatic bisecting and all these types of things because well the, the, one of the problems with zero day right now is Intel has basically said it's going to remain closed so that's you can get output from it but you can't actually use it so I'm not sure if the future of that but so anyway Lenaro is kind of doing something uh, on a similar lines separate from Lenaro the Olaf and myself as the ARM SOC maintainers we've been doing basically automatic build and boot testing for a, a pile of different ARM platforms um, so we're just doing we're doing that for for mainline for next for ARM SOC and uh, a couple other trees right now. So between the two of us, we have you know I don't know twenty or thirty different ARM platforms that are getting built and boot for for all those trees uh, whenever there's a new commit or whenever there's a new branch that comes out for those. Okay, so it, so it, from the CE work groups uh, perspective, we're just in the very uh, beginning phases of uh, looking at doing some automated testing, uh, continuous integration testing for the LTSI kernel, and I don't actually know yet what the types of um, what types of tests we're going to be doing, and in, in terms of whether they're uh, performance regression, uh, functionality tests. But uh, there is high level of interest within the work group, uh, the member companies, to do some stuff there, and including. Uh, making the testing infrastructure we develop available, and I don't know. Right now, I don't. I don't even think we've decided what we're building it on yet. It may be based yeah. on Lava, so or the, so the goal for Lenaro is that Lava. It, lava is completely open, and the goal for Lava is to be that framework so okay. broader. So the stuff we're doing as ARM SOC maintainers is much, very much short term. As the Lava kind of gets into gear and gets to a scalability point to do all these things in a much more open way. Okay. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay. What? <laughs> okay. I'll put my big little. That's supposed to be duct tape, by the way. <laughs> On there. Let me see. Where is it? Uh, somewhere. Was it? Did I miss it? Did I go past it? Tracing. Oh wait, wait. Let me see. It's back. It's before or after? Okay. It should be under PM. Oh, okay. Memory. There it is. <laughs> so, yeah. And I'm not casting aspersions on any brand of cars or anything like that. I have a suggestion for this picture. You should be putting the little vehicle upside down on top and flip it over the <laughs> Yeah, that would be the in kernel switcher <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> uh, well, it would. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to think about that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.